Hello. Good afternoon. Today, our guest is Professor Nils Carlson. Hello, Professor Carlson. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. Nils, tell us about the Ratio Institute. Well, it's a private independent research institute in Stockholm, Sweden, and I started it 20 years ago. Uh, it, it's uh, interdisciplinary. It focuses on the conditions for enterprise and um, do a lot of conferences. We do a lot of research. Uh, it's a great place, actually. Yeah. So, Nils, what, do people just get up and start research organizations? How do they get the money? How do they get people to invest in their project? Well, that, that's the, the hard, well, the hard thing is uh, to do it, I think. And, and it's a bit of a catch-22 kind of situation in the sense that in order to get funding, uh, you really have to have proved really that you can do the things you want to do. So, so you have to start on a small scale. You have to start producing material. And in our case, it's academic work. So it, it's academic books, it's academic papers. And then slowly but steadily, if you're lucky, you can get this going, you know, and, and uh, increase your funding uh, after, after some time. But it, the hardest thing is to start it up, actually, in the beginning, to be able to raise some seed money and people that trust you to, to invest, really, in what, what you want to do. That, that's the hardest thing, yeah. All right. And you have been running this organization for 20 years. We actually had our 20th years anniversary here a couple of weeks sorry a couple of days ago actually so i'm right now at the hoover institution at stanford university but i went back to sweden to be part of that celebration that was great fun so what do you do at stanford at the hoover institution i'm uh, i'm uh, doing research of course and i'm working on a book about populism uh, which i consider one of the biggest threats to the free markets and the free societies right now why is populism a threat? Uh, if you look around the world, it's um, democratic backsliding taking place in many countries. You know, leaders that uh, restrict the rule of law, the independence of courts, the free markets, and so on, democracy. And, and uh, it's very problematic, you know, and we don't really know how to handle this. And, and, uh, I guess, you know, you're from Jamaica and, and Latin America has had a populist for, well, at least since the 1950s or after the Second World War. But in Western Europe, where I come from, it's a fairly recent thing, you know, in Poland, Hungary and countries like that. But even in Sweden, we have a right-wing populist party, which is very problematic, I think. And now in France, they have this election, you know, with Macron and Le Pen, and that's, that's uh, also about these issues. So it's, um, we'll have, we'll have to work with the big things sometimes, the big issues, yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah, populism is a big issue, especially its impact on technology. Today in Western Europe and America, across the world, there are politicians who argue that technology should be controlled. Well, that that's um, an issue, of course, you know, when, when it comes to... Um, things like inequality, but social media and things like that, uh, we have to take those discussions. And, and many people have got very rich by, by developing these, these kinds of technologies. And that's fair, I think, you know, if you create money, if you become rich by voluntary exchanges, it's not a problem, you know. The problem is if it gets into politics and you have politicians interfering and you get into rent seeking then you have a problem. So, so that's one of the issues we have to discuss more, I think, if you're on the pro-market side, uh, how to handle this and how to well, make people understand why all kinds of inequality is not really a problem. Uh, so that's one issue. The other issue is, of course, that um, there is a problem with social media and so on, um, that um, I don't know if we can regulate it away, but... Um, it kind of fosters a problematic political discourse in many countries. I think. When I was a student, I wrote a paper about social media and its impact on democracy. But recently, I interviewed a distinguished academic, and he, he was positive that companies like Amazon, Big Tech, various social media platforms, they are not critical infrastructure. So his point is basically 
that the argument about regulating big tech and other platforms is, is, is really redundant. You wouldn't waste too much time on that discussion. Well, I think it's important that those platforms uh, don't restrict entry. Uh, so it can be a problem if, if uh, actually the platforms become like uh, infrastructure, even like states themselves. And that, uh, that is a risk we have to discuss. And, and uh, I think we will see regulations here, uh, not only in Europe. In Europe, I think they, they've gone fur further. And if you want to have regulation, it's very, very important that they don't restrict competition and so on, investments in these sectors, because that's the future. I mean, we have to invest in digital technologies and AI and things like that. And so there's be open. there are threats in this as well, sure. And there's also the argument that with the rise of big tech, we have seen a decline in prices. So the antitrust case for regulation isn't quite strong. No, oh, it's true. It's true. It's um, the, those technologies have been fantastic. I mean, uh, they made uh, open up the world to most people. You know, and, and, uh, uh, not the least the third world. You know, it's it's fantastic that these technologies are so cheap, that they're so accessible. You know, to so many people. So I'm a big fan of that. But uh, that doesn't mean you, have, you can't see the downsides of things as well. Well, I think that you are an interesting addition to the Uber institution. I read Richard Epstein a lot. <laughs> and he's not a fund of re regulations. Well, not, I'm not fond of regulations either, but um, I think we have to be open to, to uh, how things develop. And, and if we have the case that um, they become like huge private monopolies, because of scale economies and so on. Uh, well, we have to think about how to handle this. All right. So now we can talk about Maria Mazzucchetto and her book, The Entrepreneurial State. Because we're on the topic of populism, is, is populism a part of our thesis? Because earlier in the discussion, based on how we were defining populism, I was saying Maria is making a populist argument for industrial policy and state-driven innovation. Populism does not necessarily mean pro-poor. So, and a populist argument can go either way, it can be left, right, or status. I think you're very correct there, Lipton. Um, populism, um, at least in the history of Latin America has often meant, you know, very bad policies portraying to support the poor in various ways, but it has ended up, you know, in inflation, budget deficits, and the poor has become even poorer after those guys have been in power for some time, you know. And usually it ends up in autocracies as well. And um, I very much agree with you that um, Mariana Mazzucato and her book, The Entrepreneurial State, but also this newer book, The Mission Economy, it's a populistic, simplistic way of arguing that is attractive to politicians and even some voters may find this attractive, but in the long run, I think those policies are disastrous for, for everyone, you know? So, so in that sense, um, I think um, the influence she's gotten, and she's gotten a lot of influence in many countries, you know? I must but, tell you, she visited J Jamaica recently. Really? Yes, mm -hmm. I do agree with her argument in relation to small businesses. According to Nesta, 6% of iGood firms in the UK create 50% of jobs. Small businesses are not the engine of growth. iGood innov innovative firms drive economic growth. And most small businesses fail. So I think she's right to criticize small business policy. But her arguments do create fertile ground for entrepreneurial populism because business people are going to be impressed by these arguments and they can leverage such arguments to create a platform for rent-seeking policies. No, I think you're correct there. I mean, um, her major argument is really that the state should have a larger role in the economy uh, by regulating things, by subsidizing things, by picking winners and so on by having various kinds of, of uh, policies and systems uh, in order to, in her view, 
promote innovation and growth, but it, it will do the opposite, you know. And, and uh, um, small firms uh, are very important in the economy, but most small firms don't grow. But you have a number of fast growing firms, you know, that um, becomes the giant firms in the future. Let, let, let's take Google or Apple or Amazon. They, they started out very small, but they become very big and very successful and contributed a lot you know, to, to the welfare in, in most, most societies. So, so, so we need entrepreneurship, we need smaller firms, but uh, it's the big firms that uh, can be really efficient and really productive in the longer run. We, so we want need- gazelles to turn into big firms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, um, it's a guy, maybe you're familiar with him, uh, Beaumont. He, he wrote this very good book some 10, 15 years ago, The Free Market Innovation Machine. And he really talks about, you know, the importance of big firms that in an olig- uh, oligopical way, you know, compete with each other and invest a lot of resources privately, you know, in, in R&D and so on. That, and then in his opinion, that competitive market among big firms, that is really what creates growth in the longer run. And I think it's correct to a large extent. It doesn't mean small firms aren't important, but, but big firms are important as well. Nils, can the state really be entrepreneurial? So I am from Jamaica and there are several case studies in J- Jamaica that could clearly refute Mazuketo's argument. So there's a an organization called the Development Bank of Jamaica. And the DBJ claims to be passionate about entrepreneurship. The DBJ provides the, the DBJ provides loans to small businesses and approved financial institutions are the intermediaries. But around eight or nine years ago, I, I actually penned a piece on the topic. The DBJ reported that despite spending billions on entrepreneurship, few jobs are being created. There is also an agency called the Self Start Fund. Maybe this agency dissolved some years ago. I don't remember, but there was a report in a Jamaican publication that the Self Start Fund was in a bad shape. And I wasn't surprised at the time because the Self Start Fund was financing SMEs that we're never ready for the market. So can the state be entrepreneurial? When you're, an, when you're a venture capitalist, you care about maximizing value and innovation, but politicians are driven by populism and sentiment. So if wind energy sounds like a profitable business, politicians will say, we're going to target wind-based businesses, even if the data or studies are against, the, 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 are, are against this argument. So can the state be really entrepreneurial? It's, it's, um, I, I, I don't think so, to be honest. Um, I, I was having a major research project at the Rothschild Institute in Stockholm for some years where we published 50 papers. Uh, we summarized this into a book and um, the book was summarized into a paper published in, in the Review of Austrian Economics in 2021, uh, Bureaucrats and Markets in Innovation Policy. policy. And um, we scanned, you know, in addition to our own research, uh, the existing evidence here. And, and it's very clear that there are very, very few convincing cases that, that um, the state has had any bef- beneficial effects, you know, that the intervention of the state in these ways, you know, subsidizing you know, startups, uh, whatever, you know. So, so our conclusion is really that what, what the state could do and should do is, is to, to really strengthen uh, the institutions of the market. I mean, uh, property rights, the rule of law, to make sure that entry is open to new, new firms to enter into markets and so on. So that's the key role for the state. It's, it's an important role, but, but it's a way more limited role than Matsukato and many of those innovation agencies or startup funds are, are imagining. I mean, it, it is, it's a very famous book by, by um, uh, Josh Lerner, and he did a similar study. He went through hundreds of examples of these 
this this um, attempts to support you know venture capitalist things by the state or entrepreneurial initiatives or or yeah and he, the title of the book is quite telling it's called boulevard of broken dreams uh, so politicians and bureaucrats and some scholars like Matsukata, they have these dreams but it's very hard to prove empirically that they have any good effects. Uh, unfortunately, that's the case. Politicians should do what I expect them to do best, enhance the quality of the regulatory framework. Yeah, exactly. Make it easy to start businesses and it should, and it should also be easy to hire and fire workers. That, that, that last thing is very important. That, that's a major result actually here that innovation you know how to really put ideas into practice to make them into profitable businesses it, it very much depends on people you know uh, not so much on capital and things like that but if you have people moving around uh, you will have uh, spread over effects between different firms between different areas like universities for example into the private sectors so that's something we, we can promote, you know, by, by lowering the barriers for, for movement in the labor market. And government policies to promote entrepreneurship in the public sector could also fail because, again, politicians are not driven by market data, but rather sentiment and populism. Let me give a perfect example. Federal, tra federal technology transfer in the United States of America. So people like to talk about this, legis this legislation, the Bail Do Bay Dole Act, but would it work everywhere? Americans are individualistic. America is the most individualistic country in the West, but in a country that is not as individualistic as America, can you really say that if the government sponsors research using tax dollars that the proceeds of those funds should remain with the creator of the product. Two American other countries are quite different. So in America, pro-entrepreneurship risk tolerance, the government is enabling wealth creation by saying, hey, you're a scientist at John Brown's government agency. I'm going to give you a million dollars. But when you commercialize the product, the proceeds belong to you. That idea may work perfectly well in America, but not elsewhere. I agree. This is an area where countries have different kinds of policies, and, and uh, I don't think we have any really definite answer about which kind of institutional arrangement is the best here. Uh, but to come back to what I said, you know, if, if you look, I'm a Silicon Valley now here, and, and the, the beauty of this place is that. I mean, you can combine competences in a way that is hard in other parts of the world. So you can have brilliant scholars here at, at the engineering school at, uh, at Stanford who come up with some brilliant idea, but that guy or that woman, you know, she doesn't have the skills, the entrepreneurial skills to make this idea or this invention into an innovation, you know, something that, that is commercially viable. And she surely or he do, surely doesn't have, you know, the financial strength uh, to finance the exploitation of this in invention, you know. So here you have the opportunity to, to combine competences in a very, very productive way. And, and I think this is a challenge for most, most countries. How can we create markets where, where people with good ideas can connect with people with entrepreneurial skills that can connect with venture capitalists who can invest you know, in these entrepreneurial ventures you know, to make them grow, to make them into big com com uh, companies. And I think it's some, somehow you know, context dependent here, what kind of traditions do you have, exactly how you frame this, how you organize and regulate this. But, but, the key here is to, to make, uh, make uh, well, deals possible and to make people move between these different countries. That's the key. And they've recognized that there are two approaches to enabling business formation in the West, either industrial policy or free markets. 
but it becomes problematic when we transfer some of these ideas to the developing world, especially in the arena of regulations. In the West, companies are nurtured either via industrial policy or free markets, and then politicians talk about regulations. You cannot regulate an industry that does not exist. Whereas in non-Western countries, they usually follow the West. So when Westerners create regulations, unfortunately, politicians in non-Western countries may co to such regulations and regulate industries before they can actually achieve their potential. So you're over-regulating an industry when it doesn't really exist. And that's a problem. So Sunday, I was reading a Jamaican newspaper and the editorial was discussing the need for big tech regulation. And I said, big tech regulation cannot be a Jamaican problem yet. Jamaica doesn't have a Google or an Amazon. How can you create barriers to entry before creating the industry? So it, it makes no sense. And I blame the West because Westerners regulate industries after the fact. And then developing countries follow and these regulations are imposed on developing countries when their industries don't exist. No, I, I think uh, you're correct there. Yeah. I mean, politicians, uh, you say they're moved by, by emotions and so on, but they, they're basically moved by interests. That's my, my view here. And, and the interest of politicians is to win elections and to increase their own power. That's, that's the kind of game they're in, you know. And, and um, that means that they, they try to adopt policies usually that benefit themselves in the short run. And, and um, this is a kind of example where, where, especially the third world, but I think the developed world as well, as well, they should stay away from those kinds of, of interventions. You know, um, industrial policies usually don't work. That that's uh, the conclusion of our own research. And, and if you have to regulate those uh, big uh, global, you know, actors in some way. It, it's not necessary at all for individual countries like, like Jamaica or other parts of the developing world to care about this. They, they should start to get their economy going themselves. And to do that is, is to go back to basics, basically, you know, to, to make markets work. That's a challenge. Yeah, so an, an international investor, he said that Jamaica is one of the most regulated markets for marijuana in the world and I said that's exactly the problem <laughs> you can either say you're going to promote research support or have a free market for marijuana marijuana allowing Tom Dick and Harry to sell the product without a license in Jamaica today in order to get approval to produce marijuana you need to pay for it and the average Jamaican entrepreneur cannot afford 10,000 US dollars or 5,000 or over a million J Jamaican dollars. So it makes no sense. It is quite insensible. Canadians went to, to Jamaica directly to acquire the know-how. And after getting what they wanted, they returned to their country and had the audacity to say, oh, the market is improper, isn't properly regulated or that, the in, or that the agencies are not promoting businesses when they knew that they only wanted the know-how. They were never going to start a business in, in, in Jamaica. They want to start scalable businesses in larger markets. They went to Jamaica for the know-how and the Jamaican government was foolish enough to accept their funds and give, and give them licenses when ordinary Jamaican businesses couldn't penetrate the sector. It, it makes no sense. Interesting. Yeah, I tell you, Jamaica is an, is an excellent case study. Wow. Yeah, it makes no sense. These big boys from Canada went to Jamaica saying that they wanted to create jobs. And now they've all left and the struggling farmers who know the business well cannot participate because they don't have the money. Mm. Oh, it's typical, I think. The yeah, developing country again. We are we are over-regulating our industries. And for me, this is a personal issue because I live in a developing country. And if we were doing otherwise, all of us would have more money. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it, it's a personal issue. But in your article, you also commented on 
tax credits and tax subsidies for R&D. Do these work? Well, the status we've, we've done is that um, it's better to have uh, tax deductions than to have subsidies. Uh, because if you have tax deductions, you really have done investments that you think are profitable in the long run. And to have deductions is always better than to have subsidies. Uh, it's, it's hard to say you know, how, how important this is. Um, in a sense, it, it's a bit like a institutional competition between the developed countries. You know, if Germany has these tax deductions, you know, well, Sweden need them as well. Otherwise, some companies may move their development departments to Germany, for example, you know. So it's, it's a kind of, you know, collective action problem to get rid of this kind of stuff, you know, in these days. Uh, I do think that, that um, the state needs to invest in research and development in universities and, and uh, basic research. Uh, but most of the applied research, the research that goes into innovations, you know, which is closer to the market, that is done and should be done by, by the private sector. Um, I don't really think that sector needs those kind of, of uh, subsidies or brackets or whatever, you know. What do we lose when, the, when governments decide to invest in R&D? Well, if they invest, as I said, in universities, that, that's a different thing, you know, in basic research. That's, that's really a collective good for a society, I think, to do these investments. But if they take, you know, tax money and, or, or if they have deductions of various kinds uh, interfering into the private market and, and the, the investments by private actors into R&D, uh, you will usually get uh, very kinds of distortions in the economy, you know. Uh, how do you decide what kinds of investments should get these deductions which should not get them? How do we handle, you know, innovations in the service sector? I, I guess Jamaica, for example, has a huge tourist industry. You know, how, how do you how do you define or delimit, you know, these kind of deductions? Uh, should it only only be for, you know, more, you know, manufacturing industries, or should it be for for risk taking innovations in the service sector? I mean, this is extremely hard things, you know. So. Usually the best thing is, is for the government to stay out here, you know. Um, so, so it creates distortions, but it also creates rent-seeking behavior, you know. So, so, so um, we found was something we call subsidy entrepreneurs, you know, firms that instead of trying to convince consumers to, to buy their products, they, they start lobbying, you know, the, the government, you know, to get subsidies, you know, to get money from, from the taxpayer, you know, and then you're into real problems, you know. And I think that's typical, you know. It's um, uh, as soon as you start regulating, subsidizing, you know, doing all these things, you create a political market in a sense, you know, which skews the, the incentives, you know, in various ways that uh, it's not beneficial in the long run. Uh, there's a concept some call it grant entrepreneurship, where mm -hmm. entrepreneurs write really excellent grants, but they're not producing. As Scott Shane said, government programs to promote entrepreneurship can result in the growth of unproductive people applying for entrepreneurial grants. In the mm -hmm. private sector, most businesses will never get VC. When you are applying for VC funding, you must demonstrate how you intend to make money and create value. That's really important. Government programs like well-written documents. So when you're when you're soliciting research from private entrepreneur, if I'm going to become an equity investor, I want to see the valuation of the company. The share structure is important. Incorporation is also crucial. But politicians have a different agenda. They want to project that they know what they're doing. So they, they tend to read these fancy documents and provide grants accordingly. And this is really done in the private sector. There are greater metrics to gauge value. Uh, 
and private entrepreneurs and investors really care about money. So if you're going to get VC, more than likely you're a scalable business. Little evidence suggests that government beneficiaries are funding our scalable businesses. And then earlier, and remember earlier we discussed Jamaica and the self start fund and BBJ. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. here. Yes. No, yeah. no, it's I, you know that's a very famous paper by by the same Bill Bomol, William Bomol I mentioned, you know, where he discusses um, um, productive, unproductive, and destructive entrepreneurship. So productive entrepreneurship that that's entrepreneurship in the markets, you know, when the incentive structure is correct. Unproductive entrepreneurship. Um, that, that's, um, I would say, rent-seeking and those kind of things. Then you have destructive entrepreneurship. Then you're into crime, you know, real crime. So, so, so it's only those productive entrepreneurship that is really value-creating and um, creating you know, good consequences, consequences for society at large. So, so it's, it's extremely important here to think about when you construct systems like this, uh, what incentives do you create in the longer run? And, and I think it's almost impossible to create good incentive structures, both for, for the companies that are applying, you know, as you say, they, they become grant entrepreneurs or subsidy entrepreneurs, as we say, but also for the politicians and bureaucrats themselves. Uh, politicians, they want to say they go, do good things in elections, you know, without really having to prove that the good things are good in the longer run and the bureaucrats want to increase their budgets. That's the standard, that's the standard results for most research, you know. Well, I'm happy that you you mentioned the bureaucrats because according to one study, R and D government programs increase the salaries of bureaucrats. That's the usual uh, and the budgets, you know, not only the salaries, but the, the budgets of the department. In Sweden, we have a uh, Swedish Innovation Agency. I mean, they love Matsukata, you know, they love her. So they invite her all the time. They have, have her on advisory boards and, and uh, very problematic. Matsukato seems to be credible because of her example. So she referenced the internet, the iPhone. These examples, should we take them seriously? Do they really? validator argument no um i mean government has been there you know uh, especially you know when it comes to defense money you know in the us uh, at the early start of the internet and so on surely you had government money there but uh, that's a completely different thing than saying that Apple, Google, all this uh, development we're seeing in the world right now uh, is caused by this. I mean, it's the entrepreneurs that brought, brought these ideas, these inventions to the market, to develop them into unforeseen ways and many, many, you know, so. And, and in most cases, uh, there was no government money at all involved. So, so we've gone through the research you know, the, the facts that we can find and, and she overstates it completely, yeah. And there's the argument posited by historian Paul Foreman that government projects derailed the course of science. So if you are investing in people to create military technologies, obviously they're not creating technologies or finding treatments that are more useful in the long term well you never know i mean that that's the thing you know uh, even you know in the private sector you invest in one thing but then you find out later that hey this thing works in another sector as well or it's even more important you know so, so um sometimes you know if you that's another matsukosta has another book you know about mission driven um economy she calls it you know and she takes this you know apollo 11 and all this these moon moon shots you know in the late 60s early 70s as, as examples you know of course lots of good inventions came out of this you know because there was so much money into this so much brains went, went into this uh, but 
to make this into something that has economic value. That's a very, very different thing. And you can't do that without markets. That's what entrepreneurship and competition is all about. I mean, markets work as high called uh, as a discovery procedure. You know, competition is a discovery procedure. Discoveries like that cannot be made by research or science or government. You know. Brilliant point, simple but brilliant. The private sector is responsible for commercializing resources. So even yeah. if the government invents a product, more than likely it will be commercialized by private entrepreneurs. Yeah, or, or usually nothing happens with it. You know, it ends up in some some archive or or stays in the university because the universities are usually not as open as Stanford is the private sector collaborations and so on. As I say, you have to have this flow of individuals or people between the different sectors. If you don't have that, you will you won't see these spillover effects on this commercialization of new ideas. And again, it's difficult for governments to take our approach because governments are not driven by the market. So again, in Jamaica, there is an organization called the Scientific Research Council. And the SRC every now and then will brag that it has intellectual property or that it's doing research. But if the government is not in the business of making money like private entrepreneur and the SRC has intellectual property, why is the SRC refusing to create a platform where, where other entrepreneurs can license these products? That would be quite sensible. So Singapore, as an online platform where the government agencies show their IP products and interested entrepreneurs can purchase it to, 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 to use in their own individual businesses. Then again, Singapore is a different place from many countries. But yes, governments are not really serious about commercializing research. Oh, it's um, interesting the case you bring up here with Singapore, you know. Uh, Singapore was like in you know, in the 1960s. We know. Uh, so, so, you know, they did something right there in, in Singapore, you know. And um, part of it was called, of course, politically, you know, so, so they really, you know, um, try to promote uh, the rule of law, uh, economic freedom, these kind of things. But they also made, as I said earlier, investments in, 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 in universities and things like that. So they did a lot of good things there in Singapore. Yes, Lee Kuan Yew was not distracted. 72 to 80, the Jamaican economy contracted by 25%. The rich, famous, and highly educated left the country because they were, in, they were intimidated by the anti-capitalist rhetoric of Michael Manley and were still paying the price today. And unfortunately, he's still viewed as, an, as, a, national, as a hero. Yeah. Much, to, much to my dismay. Yeah. Today, earlier in the day, I was reading an article on the fall of L L Argentina. It's a counterfactual study, and the researcher asserted that had it not been for institutional breakdowns, Argentina would be in a better po position. And I'm like, yes, just like Jamaica, if we didn't have Manly. No, it is true. I mean, if you look, if you, you can compare Argentina with Australia, you know, in a sense, very similar countries, you know, based, you know, in the similar parts of the world, in a sense, you know, with similar climate huge agriculture sector, you know. And, and uh, Argentina was a much richer country than Australia you now in the 1930s. But then they destroyed everything by bad politics, by populism, actually, you know, as I started out talking about. You know, Nils, sometimes I wonder if, because we're talking about populism and manly, sometimes I wonder if academics fear revisiting the, the manly history. Many of the studies are very old and rare, but people, when they're talking about developmental economics, I don't see enough studies on Jamaica. And it's a minefield. Uh, I actually, when, when I was a student in 
University of Uppsala in the 1980s. I, I did a paper on Jamaica, actually. So, so uh, it's funny. <laughs> okay, what was what was the topic? Uh, I, I think the topic was why why didn't uh, Jamaica grow? You know, what, what what was the problem there? You know, so so this was a paper in, in political science, I think it was. You know, short paper, but still, I did a paper on Jamaica. Okay. More people, more, more people should work in Jamaica. I agree with you. Oh, you did that paper on Jamaica. Oh, interesting. <laughs> oh, that's why you can't speak so eloquently on the manly years. Oh, I know a little bit about it. Okay. Another controversial point is the role of business incubators. Do we need government funded business incubators? I mean, we've done research on this, and uh, research has been done in, in the, the US as well. And that's very weak support for this. You know? I agree. So, so, so um, I mean, the only benefit I can see is what we talked about before, and it's that you connect people, you know. Uh, you connect, you know, uh, people from, from uh, the universities who have good ideas sometimes with entrepreneurs and with venture capitalists. If, if you construct meeting places like this, it doesn't have to be incubators, you know, but, but we need to create structures where, where we facilitate uh, the meeting of people like this. Uh, that can be beneficial, but uh, this kind of seed money that goes into them, this kind of funding and business parks and so on that, that has become so popular. We don't see, we don't see it. We, we've evaluated, you know, the programs in Sweden. Uh, we, we can't see any, any beneficial effects if we compare you know, the companies have been in this incubated compared to counterfactuals, you know, to very, very identical companies that haven't been there, you know. So uh, the effects aren't there simply. And the, the answer isn't quite difficult. So why Combinator? Why Combinator has high standards? If you want to be incubated by a serious accelerator, you must produce. Governments, again, sentiment, Governments are talking about renewable energy. I have a business in renewable energy. I get a grant. I'm in the newspaper. The government is spending billions on, on renewable energy to avert climate change. Yeah. <laughs> that's what politicians do. They sell stories. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's their game. You know, so. Yes. They, so even for my show, I have a serious vetting process. Like my guests are not random. I have to trust the person's intellect. <coughs> yeah. Now, it's, we haven't talked about that so much, but, but I think a key thing that venture capitalists do, that government bureaucrats do, is that they really not only value the company itself, they don't really value the product or the service that the company is selling, but they really value the people. You know? They have the skills to to understand whether a person has this drive that is necessary and the skills that are necessary to really develop a business. You know? And, and um, if you tax people, if you take the money away from people and then you put it into a bureaucracy and hand it out and say you're doing some good things for entrepreneurs, you lose that competence. competence. And so taxes, in a sense, washes out the competence of the money. You know? If it's private money that has been created on the market and you invest that money as a venture capitalist, you really care about what that money goes to, you know, and what kind of people you're supporting. Bureaucrats cannot do that because they don't have the competence to do it. Human capital is exceptionally important. Germany, yeah. it is said that by next year, Germany will become the biggest market for marijuana. I'm not surprised. The Germans are known for manufacturing excellence and productivity. Jamaica may have better quality marijuana, but it is known for business, not science and industry. So human capital is quite crucial. And this is why I have been advocating that countries like J Jamaica in need of human capital attract high quality laborers. And yesterday, I was online and I was, I glimpsed 
the Jamaican newspaper and the headline was called for increased immigration. And obviously the person making the call is an entrepreneur. He's arguing that the population is dwindling and because where the population is not growing exponentially, we need to invest in human capital from abroad because we're suffering from a human capital deficit. And the trade union activist, she disagreed because her argument is that this will lead to resentment, which is not much of an argument. People will always envy achievers. Yeah. But the stark contrast between an entrepreneur and a trade union activist. I think, you know, it's, it's an idea I have here. <laughs> I think a place like Jamaica could be extremely attractive for people working remote, you know, from, from the US. So, so the climate is perfect, you know, the food is great. Uh, if you could create an environment where, where people really could live a good life down there, you know, um, but still work uh, remote for the US or for the world market. Uh, that would be something, you know, wouldn't it, you know? Uh, so during, you know, COVID-19, you know, Mexico City became a place like that. And, um, I know Bali, for example, in Indonesia was a place like that. And, and um, I think this, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the great benefits of these techno technologies we discussed earlier, you know, that it has really made it possible to work from anywhere on anything, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, if you, you could make it, can make it very attractive, you know, to high skilled people to work there. That would be outsourcing. Great. So we would literally outsource labor. You could stay in California and do research for our Jamaican business. Or you could stay in Jamaica. Doing and work, work for another company. Yeah, work for California companies, you know. I think that would be the thing. You know? Yes, How that. Housing is less expensive. Everything is less expensive in Jamaica. <laughs> Dr. Carlson, again, and I say doctor because I agree to 150%. The cost of living in Jamaica is inexpensive. The problem is that the people are too poor. So if you study in Jamaica, you cannot afford to study in America because American costs are inflated. Sure. So J Jamaica as an economic space is quite attractive to expats. If you yeah. dine at a fine restaurant in Jamaica, that's literally chicken feed. If you dine at its equivalent in New York, you're basically very, bankrupt. Very, very expensive, yeah. So one entrepreneur made a joke and some person found it tasteless. And he, he was basically saying, if you don't buy... So Starbucks is popular among a certain class of people. So you were saying, instead of going to Starbucks to buy coffee, save that money and purchase one of his homes or rent it, something to that effect. And the cost at the time was 10,000 US dollars. And people were saying he was being facetious because that's a lot of money. And I'm like, no, the economy contracted. If the economy, had a re uh, if the economy was on par with Barbados, productivity would be three times higher and we'd be richer. The issue is that the economy contracted and because the economy contracted that price is actually quite low the company is an is quite upscale so if a if, if a if a company that caters to elite people in the united states is launching a project more than likely you're going to pay more than ten thousand us dollars but the cost of living in jamaica is less expensive so the fee is automatically lower so people were upset for the wrong reason secondly the fee yeah. that was quoted it's really middle class, but the economy contracted. So because the economy did not keep pace with Barbados and America, 10,000 US dollars seem like a lot of money. Yeah. I didn't know there was such a big difference between Barbados and Jamaica. That's interesting. Yes, there, 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 there's a big difference between Barbados and Jamaica. Barbados is actually doing quite well. The IDB gave, gave Barbados top marks for the digital economy, there was a ranking that came out some time ago. Mm -hmm. And Barbados recently became the first country in the world to develop a metaverse embassy. Wow. So Barbados is actually doing quite well. I mean, that, that's interesting. You know, I haven't been to Barbados. I've, I've been to St. Lucia and the French islands, you know, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for Barbados. Barbados became a republic. 
But yeah, but they yeah. kicked out the Brits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but look, Barbados is a, is a mature country. Its success is not hinged on it being a republic. And the prime minister, when whenever Jamaican politicians speak, have to laugh because there's a running through now in Jamaica. He keeps he, he keeps telling people that we're going to achieve our full potential by becoming a republic, as if being a British colony is somewhat of an impediment to growth. Some countries experience growth in Africa under colonial rule. Cuba experienced growth under colonial rule. Jam Jamaica experienced growth under colonial rule. The legacy of colonialism doesn't prevent economic growth. If we had better leadership, we would have had growth. So <laughs> whenever they speak, I just laugh. Look at Canada and Australia. And yes, exactly. So whenever they, it's just laughable. Yeah. No, you're, you, the problem is not the inability to become a republic. You are leading the country. You are the problem. <laughs> yeah. It's a capacity that's, problem. You, you are the problem. That's the basic message, I think. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like starting a think tank where we started this. You know, it's, um, but the hard thing is to get it going. You know? Once you got it going, it, it's not that hard anymore. You know? It's hard work, of course, but... Uh, how do you how do you you know get the thing to turn around into a, a thing that really positive a positive certain that, that's a challenge. You know? hmm. But I, I can't see why you know Barbados could do it and Jamaica couldn't do it. So. Different leaders, more serious leaders in Barbados, better institutions in Barbados, and a higher quality of education in Barbados. So interestingly. Jamaica spends more on education than its peers, according to the World Bank, but it's still a laggard. We're not getting value for money. Mm -hmm. No, it's um, uh, it's a hard thing, you know. It's a, it's a lot about mentality too. I'm happy that you're bringing up that point. Another key, another key observation: a plumber or a carpenter in America is a businessman. You are a professional. It is not a hustle. In Jamaica, if you work in a in an office, it's a hustle. If you're a conductor, it's a hustle. A hustle is not a business. A trade is not a business. A business is scalable. It has value. So again, it's it's a reflection of the country's work ethic. Some countries place a premium on hard work, like Germany and America. Other countries do not. So how do you orient people to like work? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think you need it's hard. It's hard, you know. But uh, good examples, I think, will help. You know, and uh, must be some very serious, successful people in Jamaica as well. Because, yes, I mean, they're they're successful, people, but like many developing countries, the successful people are the object of envy and ridicule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we're wrapping up. Speaking to you has been a pleasure, and. There is hope for Jamaica. Maybe you should become the prime minister. I'm not interested. <laughs> well, I'm not interested either. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> None of us are interested. All let's right. Yeah. Let's say entrepreneurs. That's yeah, awesome. exactly. Yeah. The Russia Institute. I should visit Sweden and visit the Institute. I want to start a think tank. You should start one in Jamaica. That would be great for Jamaica. Uh, you know, ideas matter, you know. So, yeah, they, they do, but. Again, I live in the country, and I can tell you, I don't want to prolong the conversation because we're wrapping up, but I can tell you, Professor, there isn't much demand for ideas and intellectual debates. I don't know if that would be productive. Well, well that's, that's why they need you. <laughs> to convince them. Yeah. All right, maybe I should. Thanks again for your time. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.